Capture the passion. Welcome back. Season 3, Episode 2 of CPTP. Today we have a very special guest, Mr. Victor Soto. And we're going to talk about men in the early childhood education field. Victor, tell us about yourself. Thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> My name is Victor Soto. I am currently the Associate Director for Pacific Oaks Children's School, also an adjunct professor for UCLA Extension. Um, I've been teaching in this field for 20 plus years. I uh, started in being inspired by my niece, uh, Yadira, who is now an adult. Uh, at the time, I, after going from high school to college, coming back home, um, having odd jobs here and there, very laborious jobs, um, I ran into one of my friends who uh, was working as a TA in elementary school, mm -hmm. and he asked me to, you know, come and work there. You know, he said, you know, it's really fun. You get yeah, to work with yeah. kids. And so I checked it out. Um, I left my job of roofing <laughs> um, and then went back to school. I was living with my brother at the time and um, talked to him about going back to school and working part time, not being able to, you know, support my family with right. the rent. Um, and then was like fell in love with taking child development courses. Mm -hmm. Didn't realize that that is a field out there that I could pursue. Of course, my limited knowledge and understanding of what education is and the different, you know, um, areas of expertise. Mm -hmm. And so um, I fell in love with the things that I was learning about, you know, Erickson and Piaget and Vygotsky. And then watching my niece grow, she became um, an inspiration for like trying out these different things that I was reading about, mm -hmm. like when the yeah. ball rolls under the bed and whether or not they look for it. And so I went home and I would do these little experiments with her and, and I was just like captivated by her curiosity and her sense of wondering. And, you know, I was like, this is really interesting. Like there's something there that's like, this is true. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I went, continued, I continued to take child development courses. Um, and then I was working at the elementary school and I met a wonderful teacher. Her name is Lisa Duarte. Um, still keep in contact with her through um, Facebook. Um, she was a student at Pacific Oaks College, and she told me, you know, I was at that point in my life where I needed to make a decision about where I was going to graduate with my bachelor's degree. <clears throat> so she said, you know, if you're really interested in staying with early child education, um, she said, I suggest you check out Pacific Oaks College. And so I had never heard of Pacific Oaks College, and so I went, checked it out, met with an enrollment counselor. Um, liked their program. It really spoke to the things that I was learning from this particular teacher, Lisa. Um, and everything that she was telling me about, like working with young kids, mm -hmm. particularly in the pre-K program. Um, and then made the decision to go to Pacific Oaks College. It seemed like a really good fit in terms of the philosophy that I was developing for myself and working with um, a lot of immigrant families mm -hmm. uh, near downtown LA. And then got my bachelor's degree, moved on to work in a child development center in the Echo Park Silver Lake area, um, moved up to the administration as an assistant director. That was my first experience stepping out of the classroom, but being able to mentor other teachers and work with practicum students. Um, a few years after that, uh, I came to hear that there was a position at Pacific Oaks Children's School. I applied for the master teacher position, got the position. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been there for 16 years, and this is my first year as the associate director. Okay. So just to go back into your career path, you didn't start off into wanting to be a child development expert, right? It was just, did you just, again, it, through your um, niece experience that you're like, hey, you know what, I'm going to learn about this. You took a course, you liked it, and here you are. So it really wasn't your first choice, per se. It was se. not. But, you know, neither was roofing or laying <laughs> concrete right, right, or, right. you know, working in a warehouse and doing those kinds of laborious jobs, right. you know, which I have a deep love and respect for. The of course. That do those jobs. So it's it's something I think for our, our audience to understand that you're now at a point in your career where you're going to be taking over the children's school pretty soon. Correct. Congratulations on Thank that. Thank you very much. We want to understand that this wasn't a path that you had already concocted and put out in your mind saying this is what I'm going to do. You took different routes to get to where you're at now. Sure. And this route has given you I'm sure a lot of experience which we'll talk about um, and here you are now. Yeah. Uh, as a very competent, very educated, knowledgeable leader. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned mentoring other teachers, which is what TPTP does. We mentor students, specifically those that are going to go into the teaching field. Um, what was it like for you being a mentor? I know since I first met you, we go back 20 plus years. Something like that. Um, I remember the first <clears throat> first conversation that I had with you to me was, man, this guy, he, you know it. Mm -hmm. And I've shared this story with you many times. We were having lunch. 
I was having a big old bowl of corn with, um, uh, what was it, uh, a maruchan soup. Okay. You were having a big bowl of, of salad, and we're talking. Of, uh, that's all we could afford at that time. Yeah. And you asked me, where do you see yourself? Uh, yes. Um, I believe it was five, five years from now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm leaving <clears> away <throat> thinking, I, I remember telling you, it doesn't matter. I'm making 10 bucks an hour. I got benefits. I got my girlfriend. I got my car. I'm good. I don't need to do anything else with my life. Sure. And then you followed up with, so you really think you're going to be here <laughs> <laughs> 10 years from now. That was, um, to me, that was one of those conversations that I, I told myself, <clears throat> I need people like you in my life to help me pave a path for my career. Now, granted that I wasn't going to a university at that time. I, I had, remember. I had just finished... Um, my AA ID lack, mm -hmm. and very proud of myself with my AA degree, thinking that's it. I got a degree. I'm good. Yeah. Um, what was it like for you to mentor people like myself that really didn't have a vision? Sure. Um, now, now that you you have a position where you are going to mentor everyone else, what what does it feel like being a mentor? Well, it feels great uh, in that my years of experience have allowed me to, my experience is really, how do you put a price on that? Mm -hmm. you know, and how do you put a price on your experience or other people's experience? You can't. And I think it's the value that you have in yourself in knowing that you, in a way, are changed for a better person. You're enriched by allowing yourself to be open to receive the experiences of others. So um, I used my experiences and, um, you know, I characterize characterize myself as just being a knucklehead you know in my like late teens <laughs> early 20s not anymore um excuse me not anymore <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that go on <laughs> uh, i i enjoy life but not in the same way that i did back then <clears throat> um but so i remember having a conversation with another great teacher who influenced me cynthia leva who used to work at that elementary study, elementary school that i used to work at and i remember feeling looking around um some of my peers and friends at the time, mm -hmm. and you know, many of them were incarcerated, you know, um, alcohol, drug abuse, gangs. Again, that was my environment. Uh, but once I started working at the elementary school, my the people around me had changed. Mm -hmm. So I was being surrounded by people who were in the education field, and right. I remember talking to this particular teacher, Cynthia Leva, and expressing to her how I felt like other people that were ahead of me in life and kind of just expressing that. And she said, you know, maybe what you needed, you know, then a couple of years ago, say, you know, two, four or five years ago was to let, you know, let those experiences come into your life. And that's now what's driving you to go to school. <clears throat> I think at the time I was interviewing for even interviewing her for a project for one of my classes. And she, she said to me, I remember, she's like, you're asking some really deep questions in terms of, you know, wanting to get the root of the interactions that teachers have with children. And so this was for one of my classroom, for one of my class projects. And, and so I remember saying, realizing or coming to understand that the thing that she was trying to say to me was these experiences that I had had between like 18 and like 22, while I thought of myself as being just like a knucklehead, she mm -hmm. said, you know, those experiences have now driven you to be where you're at in terms right. of like, I mean, I was taking like 18 units in one quarter because, or one semester, because I wanted to like just be able to graduate. I wanted to be able to play catch up to some of the other people that I knew were like my age, but mm -hmm. were already graduating from college, whereas I was still going to a community college. Mm -hmm. and, and it also in itself became an experience that nothing is linear. Right, right. Like we have these... Um, ideas of what life should look like mm -hmm. right by you know the definition of society and it doesn't you know it doesn't fit to everybody and i realized that i don't have to follow some somebody else's script right right and so not to have you follow my script but being able to see this as an opportunity to say to you where do you see yourself because at, I think I was like 29 and you were about 25, not to date ourselves, but about that time. <laughs> and in my mind, I was thinking about my personal experience right. and thinking about where you were and wanting wanting you to come to that realization of like, there's something better, right. bigger right. out there for you. You probably just don't know it yet. In the same way that between 18 and 22, I didn't know mm -hmm. 
that I would be here today, you know, in my personal life and my professional life. Right. And now you're you're at a point where you're going to be the executive director of a, a very very high quality preschool. Not to be biased, but be very truthful. Um, the the question that you asked me was very profound. Where do you see yourself? And I think that for me to continue to have that relationship with you after we went our separate ways professionally was, man, you know, I see someone that I admire that's a man, you know, and coming from a very traditional Mexican background, you don't talk about admiring another man because it's perceived as not masculine. Sure. You know, it is macho, it is Mexicano, you know. Um, but then again, the field that we work in, we're the minority. <laughs> men in the early childhood education. What has been some of your challenges as being a, a, a man in the classroom? Sure. I mean, I think <clears throat> the thing that you're getting at is there's a stigma around right. like, men in early childhood education as they, their education is this dichotomy between K through 12 and preschool, mm -hmm. where education should just be like, you know, life experience. And so... Um, I know you just had Dr. Judy Cross talk about, you know, 90% of the brain develops, you know, in the first right. five years. And so how critical is that? Mm -hmm. And yet that's separated from, again, the discourse of education right. that's limited to K through 12. So um, there's a stigma, I think, around early child education and child development and men particularly in child development, because um, I think that one of the things that we work really uh, well on in terms of helping and supporting children is their social emotional development. And I know that one of the conversations that you and I had had, and I think to the point of the interaction that you and I had, that, that conversation about whether men are, are capable mm -hmm. or allowed to be able to express themselves in a way that we encourage everybody to. Right. Like, why should expressing yourself and be limited to like one gender? Mm -hmm. Just we don't do that with children. We don't do that with boys. We don't separate boys from girls when we work in the classroom. Mm -hmm. In terms of the things that we want children to be able to to experience and gain mm -hmm. from being in a social setting, right? And so I remember looking at you, and in a way, again, coming to a point where I knew that I, it, for me it was an opportunity to say, "Hey, I I think that you're you're very passionate. You're an excellent teacher, but you can grow from this. Like, there's no reason why you need to settle." To just having an AA, you know, and working in the classroom. I don't know if you remember, but I, I remember distinctively asking you to go back to school, and I think there was like some resistance, and then <laughs> there was a change, and a promotion became available, a position, and you didn't get it, and, I, and you knew the reason why. Right. You didn't have a BA, and I was like, oh, that that hurt me yeah. so much because I would have, I knew that you were confident to take over that position, mm -hmm. but in terms of the the requirements that teachers are required to have, right. you couldn't, you know, take that position. So, and, and that I think, and I don't know, you can speak to this, became this moment, maybe a, a, a catalyst for you to like go back to school. Mm -hmm. there, there was a lot that, a lot of people that I give a lot of credit to um, that pushed me into getting back to school. My wife being one of them, my dad who, uh, we lost him about going on three years, my, my mom, and, a lot of it came from my own environment changing. Uh, my, my compadre Edgar, he talks about this so much. You want to be successful? Surround yourself with successful people. You pretty much are putting yourself in a situation where everybody's speaking the same language of success. Now, success is defined differently. It's very subjective. Sure. But to, to me, at that point, I remember looking at you and just admiring that you're educated. You're a man and you're educated. You know, you have a BA, and for the record, a BA for me at that time was something that I would never accomplish because of a lot of bad experiences that I had as a student. One, not being able to speak English. Sure. Uh, coming into the country illegally, not yeah. having the financial resources yep. to say, hey, you know what? I can be successful academically with a, with a bachelor's degree. Um, a, a lot of it also had to do with the way I felt as a student. My self-efficacy as a student was really low mm -hmm. because I didn't have teachers that were passionate about my interests. And that was what drew me to you was that you genuinely cared about me. You took a genuine interest in me into being successful. That was like, hey, you know, I, I got to have this guy in my life to help me get to that point. And 
I'm very grateful that you have because, you know, and it's a whole different conversation where the accomplishments that we've shared through recent conversations, the things that we've done in our career, and now we're at a point where we're sharing all this knowledge out there for other people to be seen as mentors, specifically in education, because men really are not <laughs> necessarily in the education field. Um, what drew you into wanting to be in a position of administration with um, children, <clears throat> specifically preschool children, and knowing that your mentorship is, comes with that position um, anyway. So what, what is it that draws you into that? For me, it's about uh, having a growth mindset mm -hmm. and wanting to continue to grow. It's almost like this cycle and this loop that keeps repeating itself, right? Um, one of the things I like to share with parents is, you know, we are lucky to work with, say, two-year-olds. And we get to master working with two-year-olds for, say, five, six, seven, eight years. And so we were, the master teachers are working with two-year-olds. And so we know this age very well. And every year repeats itself. And we just know what to expect from two-year-olds. And so it could be three-year-olds. It could be four-year-olds. It could be five-year-olds. Again, preschool, you know, zero to five. And um, as parents, we, we grow with our children, right? So our child is never two twice, right. <laughs> never three, three times right. or twice, you know? So for, our, for parents, and I can speak as a parent, you continue to grow with them and you're facing different challenges. Mm -hmm. And so as a teacher, you master one thing and then you share that with others. Mm -hmm. So part of our work is always mentoring our assistant teachers, associate teachers. And so you learn to share your information, your knowledge, your skills to somebody else. And then you move on to a different project if that is your mentality that you want to continue to grow. So seeing other projects come up and going, I want to, I want to be a part of that. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like you said, surrounding yourself with other people, being a part of like book clubs. And I'm like, sure, I, I read a book and have a discussion with mm -hmm. other directors and then networking. And it's like you grow because... A, you're reading something, and then B, you're having a, a conversation with other people that are at that level of, again, having an investment in your in your career, mm -hmm. right? And so it's this cycle that keep re repeats. It's a cycle that keeps repeating itself in that there are different opportunities if you see them as an opportunity to grow. Right, right. So now tell me about the challenges. Any challenges as um, being in, in the field? Tons of challenges. <laughs> There are, let's see, um, teaching in the classroom uh, several times. Uh, I had had, I had mothers, mm -hmm. you know, straight up say to me, um, I don't know you, I have all the respect for you, but you may not change my daughter's diaper. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay. You know, I just had not developed that trust. Right. And I don't fault parents for, um, for having those like trust issues, but then Again, where I identify a gap, I work towards closing that. And so it's a matter of building that trust with that mm -hmm. child and with that parent. And then sure enough, at some point, we make a 180 and, you know, I bond with that parent. Yeah. I bond with that child. And, and then we look back at the beginning of the year and, you know, they're like, you're a great guy. And I'm like, well, <laughs> thank you. I, again, I set out to mm -hmm. accomplish that because, again, I value the child and by extension, I value the family. Right. right? And so um, other challenges have just been... I remember doing a roundtable discussion around men and early child education and and pay. Mm -hmm. You know, again, education is divided, such a dichotomy between K and 12 and preschool or early child education, where we are just not, you know, compensated mm -hmm. the way that other, you know, teachers in other districts are. And it's really unfair for the amount of work that we do. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a stigma around, I think, also men and early child education because um, you know, we don't get paid the way that in other fields or in other careers you are compensated. And so as a man, right, you think I, I'm married, I have kids, I, I'm looked by my culture as the provider. Mm -hmm. And so what happens when your spouse makes more money than you, you right. know, and do you take a shot at your ego or do you say, you know, I do you see yourself again, not being defined by society and saying, I've chosen a career that I'm passionate about. Um, I'm confident and I'm confident about what I do and like I'm good with that. So again, defining success can look differently for everybody. Right. right. So now, now let's, let's dive into specifically this. Any challenges that you've faced because you're a man, you mentioned that example of a mother telling you don't, 
the ones you're changing uh, my child. Um, I'm sure you can see that from a parent's perspective. Sure. Um, but as as a teacher, give us a teacher's perspective. What are other challenges that you have faced that maybe get you to the point where you're questioning your your path, or even your career, to say, you know, is this really worth it? Honestly, no. No, I, I you know, not in the classroom as a teacher, I have to say, um, I think that men um, are often praised a lot by, mm -hmm. you know, the other gender, women who are pretty uh, dominant in early child education. And so they see the value that men bring mm -hmm. to the classrooms. Um, administrators, people have just come up to me and say, thank you for yeah. being in this yeah. field. Yeah. And that's really rewarding. Um, I don't need that, but because again, I've made that decision myself. Mm -hmm. I knew that at one point I had to make a decision of whether I wanted to go into the K through 12 uh, field or stay in early child education. And I made that decision very consciously that this is what I wanted to do. Um, of course, when I made the decision, I didn't, I had not seen myself um, being a college instructor or mm -hmm. being you right. know, in administration, but I was inspired by many teachers who were doing that. And I just, it fascinated to me that mm -hmm. It fascinated me that I had instructors who were, again, at a college level teaching college courses and were still actively in the classroom. And that to me was like sort of like a goal that I wanted to reach. I was like, wow, that's really cool. You get to use your experiences mm -hmm. in the classroom working with children. And we see examples of that in the classroom. That's my motto now, and which, that's, that's, <laughs> which is what I shared with you in terms of coming to join, you know, Pacific Oaks Children's yeah, School. It's, yeah. you know, I know that you're very passionate. Um, and I feel that, again, your philosophy and your pedagogy really aligns with our value system. And so I said to you, right, if you're going to come here, everything that you're doing as an instructor, you're going to see in the classroom. Yeah, yeah and that's, I think that's one of the biggest rewards that it's not really talked about a lot. into saying that if you're a teacher, you don't have to stay in the classroom. And I think that the more we talk, the more conversations we have like this, we put out there into letting future teachers know that you don't have to stay in the classroom. If it's preschool, it's K-12, whatever it is, there's other avenues that you can take to make a really good career out of it um, financially as well as very passionate about where sure. it kind of doesn't feel like if you're working. One, one of the times um, you ask me, like, you get paid for this, you know that, right? <laughs> Just uh, how much fun we were having in the yard with the kids. Um, but... I'm, I'm curious to to take the conversation with, with this route. Um, th a lot of conversations that I've had in the past with female teachers, mm -hmm. it's, um, oh, you guys just don't come with a lot of baggage like we do. We're mothers. Um, some of us are single mothers. You know, we come here and we have to be mothers to children. We have to be nurturing. We have this other emotional component that for some reason it's believed that we don't carry. Um, do you do you think that it's not accepted that we also have we might have an emotional baggage because we as men don't talk about our emotions or is that just a perspective that women believe that they have better at than we do? I have a, I have a problem with the way that you're phrasing this question. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly because it's a generalization of all women. Right. right. And so right. I can't. I no, can't, no, no. I can't speak to, to that. To my, to my experience with okay. women in the classroom, not not making it. Yeah. A so then that's your experience. Again, it hasn't been mine, mm -hmm. you know, and so I, I really can't speak to that. But I know that you and I have had a conversation about um, whether or not men are emotionally available for children. Right. When um, I know you and I have shared some very personal experiences and the growth that we have done in, in our personal lives mm -hmm. and that how that has really allowed us to be open and receptive to, again, exploring our emotions. And again, as educators, again, gender does not define a teacher's ability to be able to help children with that. But mm -hmm. certainly, um, I mean, again, I, I can only speculate, you know, this person that asked you this question uh, or was making these comments to you where, where they were coming from, you know, but so I think, this may be an isolated incident, but I don't think oh. that's sort of a general, <laughs> it hasn't been my experience that, that there's this general feeling from women that, you know, that, I don't know, that they have a, a heavier burden that we do. We, we certainly maybe don't put it out there because, again, there are these societal expectations or norms that we don't do that, whereas perhaps it's seen as socially acceptable for women to be able to do that, and men, we just generally don't talk to each other about the things that we are experiencing, but again, 
you and I have had a different relationship in terms of being able to share those very things. deep conversation yeah. um, that we've had about that. What what's your perspective on social emotional development um, with the young children? More specifically, what is is it something that we should be prioritizing in the classroom over academics? Or absolutely, I mean. One of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite books is the research is on our side in terms mm-hmm. of what we know now about how the brain and the body develops and how valuable it is for children to feel safe, seen, and secure. Mm-hmm. And who does that who who does that responsibility fall onto? The people in the classroom. So again, you're not defined by gender. Uh, uh, this field it's not limited to a, spe- a specific gender. Right. Right. So you don't have to be a woman to be able to do that for children or to be able to provide that for children. You can be a man too. Right, right. And, and that's, um, I think, where a lot of conversations that I've had with students in the, at the university level, it's, well, you know, I don't know if, if I can do that. I don't, I don't know if, if I can help a child express their emotions where I myself struggle with that. Mm. Um, and then it conversation leads into the cultural belief of, again, sure. a man not showing emotions, not expressing themselves. Um, Part of our, again, goes back to a lot of conversations we've had where we do talk about emotions and how it's perfectly fine to express your emotions. What, what's your approach to helping children that hypothetically come from a background where men don't express emotions? Um, for my own personal experience, I come from a very traditional Mexican culture where it was very difficult. And I was told many times by my parents, you know, it is hombre, you're a man, don't cry. Don't show those emotions. But now as a teacher, it's like, wait, so if I see Jorjito crying, it's okay for me to let him cry. And it's okay for me to help him ex- show and express those emotions. Do, do you think that that's, that can be a, can pose as a potential challenge for future men that want to get into the field? Their cultural clash with emotions? Absolutely. But that's where you have to do that groundwork. Right. You know? So whether it's going to... Um, a two-year college or a four-year college, you're going to study. You're going to study about, like, say, Rothenbrenner, mm-hmm. you know, and his um, ecological theory. And I, one of the my favorite activities to do with college students is to have them create their own ecological model mm-hmm. and understanding the different systems that have impacted their views, um, their values, their beliefs, their practices. So culture is just one of those things that drives all of those things. Mm-hmm. And so understanding yourself first before you step into the classroom. Um, to better understand children who are coming from either a the same culture or from different cultures, mm-hmm. right? And then becoming culturally uh, competent and also culturally sensitive to right. again working with a similar culture or with other cultures. Mm-hmm. So is is it just a, a cultural ideology of men not showing emotions? Yes and no. <laughs> Elaborate. <laughs> is it a cultural ideology? Um, we learn everything about the way we socialize from our culture. Yeah. So if you accept that as a premise, that's true. Um, that's, again, going to drive your values, beliefs, practices. But are you also adopting a growth mindset that allows you to see beyond that? Mm-hmm. And if so, then the answer is no, because you can create change. Right. The thing that right. you want right. to be able to do, at least I do, in my position, as I've learned, again, through my experiences, you're an agent of change, mm-hmm. right? And so you're changing other people in the same way that you're changing. So how, how do we change the approach that's out there with academics being oh. pushed down in, in early childhood education instead of social-emotional development? Because um, previous uh, previous episode, Dr. Judy Cross talked about the research supports us. And you just said it, the research is on our side that says social emotional development is a whole lot more important and has a longer term of success yes. in the academics as yes. well. And as life. opposed to pushing it down into yeah. saying, you know what, the, the idea of getting a, a head start with academics at a younger age gives you a longer academic uh, success. Um, how, how, do we, how do we break that? Again, you have to see yourself as an agent of change, mm-hmm. right? You talked about developing a sense of agency. And so what's your impact on the world? You know, you're having me here, you know, you're a host, um, having people come to your podcast and speaking about these things and putting it out there, that's right. impacting some people. 
You're also an instructor. You impact others. Those people go to their classrooms and they impact other children and families. So there's work in many different ways that can accomplish that, right? Um, again, um, it, it can be done in many different ways. But I know that one of the ways that I'm doing that personally is, again, mentoring teachers at the school that I work at through my college courses, now coming on here and speaking about my experiences. So mm -hmm. in those different ways, um, we can create that change. Do you find it exhausting sometimes where you're you're pushing for social emotional development per se, but yet you have bigger school districts, um, other organizations that are pushing academic? So I'm, I'm your mentee and I'm, oh, you know what, I get you, Victor. I completely understand. I align with you. But then I go to work and now my supervisor, my district wants me to follow this prescribed curriculum that has nothing to do with social emotional development. Mm -hmm. So is, is it a clash for you or how, how do you think? So in, in my mind, it's like, okay, I, I get it, but how do I transfer the knowledge that you're giving me into the classroom where the bigger school districts aren't really focusing on? Mm. It's a great concept of, um, it's called creative maladjustment, mm -hmm. where again, you have to kind of work within the system. Um, some of my workshops and presentations, are, you know, revolving around emergent curriculum, often I get that question asked, like, but how do I weaving, how do I weave in the assessments that I'm required to do as a teacher mm -hmm. and practice emergent curriculum? And so I'm like, let's talk about it. Like, let's pick a topic, something that you're currently, you know, working on in your classroom with your children. And so it's sort of modeling some of that for the teachers. And then they're like, ah, oh, I see it. Yeah, yeah. Give us an example of that. Sure. How, how do I weave in emotions in, uh, in the previous episode, uh, Dr. Judy talked about the letter of the, of the week. So how, how can I incorporate emotions with the letter of the week? Yeah, sure. I had a student who was once working on, again, working at a school district where they followed a, a, a prescribed curriculum and they were working on pumpkins or, or fall. And um, one of the activities that she had done with the children in her classroom was had to have the children decorate the pumpkins. And so this was part of their uh, we, their semester-long project. And part of it was providing documentation mm -hmm. of the activities that they were doing. And in one of the pictures that she brought to the classroom, she, to the classroom, she had um, put together all the pumpkins that the children had, quote unquote, decorated with things like stickers, feathers, mm -hmm. and, and paint even. And there was one particular uh, pumpkin that stood out to me. And it was a pumpkin that was painted all black. And so I said to her, I asked her whose pumpkin it was. And so she told me the name of the child. And as we started to continue on the project, um, I said to her, I need you to tell me more about this particular child. And she said, oh, that particular child. And like that emotion of like, oh, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, from what I recall, the, the student was telling me that in the classroom, this particular child gave her like the hardest time, challenged her the most. And so I started to work with her on being able to focus more on him while still meeting the needs of the entire classroom. Again, one of the challenges of all teachers is to work with individual children while considering the greater needs of like the entire classroom. And so for the sake of this particular project that we were working on, she kept focusing on this particular child. Um, and I learned a little bit more of the history of this particular child, again, some of the challenges that the family was facing. And so I started working with her, again, using um, Bruffenbetter's ecological theory on identifying the different systems that are impacting this particular family and hence the child. And again, something within her changed in terms of the way that she saw this particular child, which is, again, great. You want teachers to be able to change their lens from where they were to where they are now in terms of seeing, using this theory to put it into practice and to work collaboratively with the family and with, with the child. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the semester, um, she said, I remember saying to you, oh, that child, and she's like, I've grown so much to like love this child. Mm -hmm. she, that's the word that she said, love. It was about building, was there some form of relationship bond during yeah, that? Absolutely. So she became closer with the child and no longer saw the challenges that the child presented in the classroom as challenges, rather as an unmet need that the child had. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that we talked about, right? Again, using research to better understand how children are development, how the body and the mind develops, mm -hmm. and seeing behaviors not so much as 
for what they are, but looking at them as an unmet need. If children aren't able to express themselves verbally and be able to be in, and are, are not able to share their emotions, they're going to manifest themselves in a different manner, right? And so often we see those behaviors as red flags or unacceptable, socially unacceptable behaviors, but really it's a child's best way to be able to say to you, uh, there's something that's not being met by other people mm -hmm. or the adults in my life. What is that? Wow, that's a, it, it, such a hard concept. I'm, I'm hearing you speak. And the first thing that comes to my mind is the IEPs, uh, individual, individualized education plan that are in the K-12 system and even now in preschool. And talking about needs that are not being met. So I'm gonna, I, I want to know your perspective on it. Some of my needs have not been met, hypothetically, okay? And I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. How can I identify those needs that I'm lacking on children? That's a really great question. I don't know that I'm completely equipped to answer that because I'm <laughs> just going to speculate on what that is. Right. And, you know, that's putting me in a position of, like, um, again, something that I, like, not, you know, just your, trained just, for. No, just your your opinion. So it, it, what what I what I want to know is, teachers out there come with a lot, right? And I asked you earlier about baggage, um, mm -hmm. whether it be conflict at home, lack of financial resources, other other things that might take their focus away, but yet they come into the classroom, and one of my tasks as or expectation as a teacher is to help children meet those needs but if i'm struggling with so much how am i how am i gonna how am i equipped to help children meet those needs that they themselves need um that's a good question um one of the things that i suggest to a lot of teachers you know to to do is to practice self-care yes you know let's talk about self-care it can look different for so many people. Mm -hmm. um, we know the value that um, being in nature provides mm -hmm. for everyone, children and adults, which is the reason why you see people going on walks. We have great landscapes here in Southern California, mm -hmm. going on hikes, going to the beach, right? Um, for some people, it's doing yoga, meditation, mm -hmm. reading a book, listening to music. There's so many healthy ways to be able to, um, to provide self-care. You know, um, it can look different for different people. But um, one of the things that I think since COVID um, has, you know, happened is a discussion around, um, and even before that, compassion fatigue, mm -hmm. right? And so how do you take care of the people that take care of other people, mm -hmm. right? Because again, it's our, our batteries get drained. And I think that if you have that conscious awareness that, um, put to put it into practice, that it's important to always practice self-care, then hopefully you won't get to that point yeah. of like, I'm burnt out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that's really true. Um, so I want to talk about uh, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And um, I know you've done some research on trauma. Mm -hmm. um, we dive into that topic. Sure. <laughs> um, and you talk, you're talking about children's needs and understanding those needs. Do you think, we know what the research indicates. Adverse childhood experiences does impact cognitive, emotional. It, it impacts the child's life, not just short term, but long term. Yeah. Do you think that sometimes maybe of uh, these traumatic experiences that the child hasn't been able to vent out or even have therapy or a type of resource to do that self care individually as a child, that, does it really play that much of a role into the child's ability to learn? Absolutely. And do you think that? Maybe we need to do, we need to embed some form of trauma education on teachers to be better equipped. One hundred percent. There was um, Dr. Gabor Mate who talks about um, teachers don't have any classes on trauma, mm. right? Um, doctors don't have uh, a lot of experience with trauma. So how is it that we go to doctors to help us heal? We go to to teachers to help us learn where they themselves don't even understand what that means. What's your what's your take on that? Well, I, I love the research from Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, right? Yeah. Who um, did the ACES study. 
I think, you know, it's revolutionary work in terms of also herself, you know, um, coming to an understanding of like people are coming to doctors for help and are being treated for things that um, are not really getting to the root of what, you know, is the problem in right. people's lives. And so, again, research is on our side in terms of understanding that there are uh, things that happen in in our lives as children that carry over into adult, again, as a premise, we accept that that's true. The research is there. Again, um, creating change in many different levels is really important because, again, we were working with children who, again, are an extension of adults who perhaps are repeating that same cycle. Right. You know, again, um, you and I have had a lot of conversations about our culture and the way that we are trying to break these cycles of our past experiences now as parents, mm -hmm. right? So it's developing that growth mindset and creating that awareness and creating change in your personal lives as well as in your professional lives. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a difficult thing is breaking cycles. Sure. Um, so love my mom. She's amazing. But my mom is a firm believer that um, vapor rub will cure everything. <laughs> you have a headache, pull some vapor rub on your temples. <laughs> You have a cop put some vapor up on your feet. And, you know, all these other things. And, and it has a lot to do with culture, the cultural belief in that. Um, breaking, breaking that cycle, any, any type of cycle is very difficult because for so long we've normalized certain behaviors. Yeah. For so long we've been told that this is the way it has to be. Right. Now as an adult, as an educated adult, you're, you're seeing and you're reading, wait, all of these studies say that if we do this, we have a different outcome. Right? How hard is it for us to break these cycles within our culture? Um, there's this belief that um, abuse is intergenerational. There is a thing of intergenerational trauma. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's again, research in our, is on our side in terms of there are many studies that have been done on, um, on animals, but you also see it in humans. Right. You know, in terms of um, looking at rats who have been shocked um, and then creating these experiences um i remember one of the studies i remember reading on i can't remember by who was um they did a study on lab rats where they were being shocked when they were like touching the cheese say mm -hmm. and then um, a generation later you saw the baby rats going up to the cheese and having the same reaction even though they didn't actually mm -hmm. have those experiences and so we, there are studies now on, um, as an example, Holocaust survivors and a generation later having symptoms of that same type of trauma in, like, uh, you know, grandchildren. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, the trauma that we're talking about, so it's, it's divided into a capital T and a lower T, right? Big trauma and middle trauma. Mm -hmm. And how it's not, it's not just the effect that it has on you but on your nervous system correct and how that nervous system responds it's sometimes we subconsciously don't understand why we're responding that way but that's because our brain might not remember but our nervous system does correct so what's what's your um expertise on that give enlighten us give us give us some more about that I, I'm still learning a little bit about this, so please forgive me uh, for if I botch what you, I'm about done, to say. You've done a lot of amazing <laughs> research, Victor. Give yourself more credit. <laughs> share share I, the again, I, I see myself as, as a learner. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, it speaks to what we talked about earlier. Um, having an adult present in our lives, someone that we can turn to, is significant, significantly going to support our ability to... Uh, be able to regulate. Mm -hmm. So we know that um, in life there we are going to face adversity and one of the biggest predictors of children being academically ready and successful uh, in their later years, particularly in their younger years, is to have an adult presence. So whether it's a parent, a teacher, a counselor, um, whether it's I'm, you know children who have had um, step parents, Right? Again, other adults that can attune to them. One of the things that um, research has shown is that when there is a child that's dysregulated, the best thing that that particular child can have present in their lives is an adult that's regulated. If you're dysregulated, you're not going to be able to 
support a child to be able to come to um, self-regulation. They're only able to self-regulate by being able to co-regulate with an adult that is centered. Right. And, and that, that's where um, it sort of takes me back into how we started the conversation. Um, centered. How, how do we get centered? And I'm going to throw in um, the, the cultural lens there. Mm. Um, culturally, women tend to be more centered. Culturally. Mm -hmm. okay? Culturally. Um, because they're more attuned into their emotions. Right? They're more attuned into um, being able to compartmentalize their feelings and emotions better than men, culturally. Okay? Okay. Um, I mean, I'm speaking from my own um, Mexican traditional cultural background mm -hmm. um, because we're men. We don't have emotions except anger. That's the only one that's, that, through my culture, has been validated. Um, so if, if I'm, I'm dysregulated because I don't know how to regulate my emotions because of the lack of acceptance culturally, how, how can I, as an adult find a way to get centered when I, it's been normalized not to talk about my emotions. Sure. Again, uh, we talked to you, well, you touched a little bit about um, the automatic nervous system. Again, the work that Dr. Stephen Porges has shed light on in terms of the polyvagal theory and the way that our automatic nervous system works is that we go into these fight, flight, freeze modes, mm -hmm. right? And so, Say that you are in a red zone and you're just regulated and you are just like, oh, I just want to, you know, break something, lash out, right? Um, culturally, right, what would, the word, what would our Latin Mexican parents say? Callate, para, mm -hmm. stop, you know. Just regulate, they're yes. just regulated themselves. Yeah, go to your room, you know. So again, um, they create a distance between themselves and you as a child that's in a state of dysregulation. And so we don't know how to come to a, a state of, um, of calmness. Mm -hmm. um, because we know that the value of having an, an attuned adult as adults, as educators, right, and the benefit that that has to children, again, we're shifting our mindset from our cultural experiences to what we know the research supports. Right. And so by creating that change within yourself, you're, a, you're better able and equipped to help a child in the classroom or in your own personal life with your kids. Mm -hmm. And how, how does one get there? Is it um, do you just throw research at me and say, well, look, Jorge, this is what you have to do. Do this, do that. How, how, how can I myself get to that point when, again, it's been normalized, it's been culturally accepted, mm. it's been, it, it's, a, it's a social construct that for me as a man, I don't need to do the work and to be centered. How, what's my starting point? Today? Any, any point is a starting point. Like there's no, again, there's no linear way in terms of like, when do you start that, where, when do you start that work? But certainly you're hearing, you're hearing about it. You're again, curious about it, right? You're studying, you're reading up on it and, and then you're reflecting on that, mm -hmm. you know, and then you're creating change. So you're becoming conscious and then confident about this particular topic and then creating change. And so, um, I think the other important aspect to this is you're human. Right. So you're going to, you know, have bad days. You're going to have days where you're unable to do that. And that's one of the things that um, when I'm exploring this content with uh, students in the classroom in the higher education and, you know, they're having bad days or they're unable to attune to a child, I'm like, it, it's okay. Like, you're not bad for, you know, not being able to do that. As a parent, you're not bad for having those days. Um, you know, you have to give yourself credit and understand that, you um, you know, you're going to make mistakes and that sometimes um, both as a parent, as an educator, maybe you over respond and sometimes you under respond. And again, it's all a cycle of learning with your experiences. Yeah. So I, I heard something uh, very interesting in a podcast uh, just yesterday talked about uh, men and women. So this, this individual was in a, in a workshop and he said, um, raise your hand if you talked about your emotions. And he said, um, about 90% of the people that raise their hand were women. And he said, okay, raise your hand if you talk to your emotions with someone the same sex as you. And again, that 10% of men that raise their hand, they're about half of them put their hands down. Mm -hmm. And then he asked them, well, if you don't talk about your emotions, then how do, how do you get to that point of understanding your emotions, regulating yourself, mm -hmm. centering yourself? Um, is, is, is there some form of gender 
construct of because you're a man, you don't talk about your emotions because you're a woman, you do. And is it socially acceptable that because women talk about it, men don't? What I'm getting at is I know that the difficult of breaking a cycle, whether it be abuse, whether it be trauma, whether it be mental health, breaking a intergenerational cycle, it's difficult. And the groundwork comes within ourselves is what I'm hearing you say is if I acknowledge that I need help, any, any, any time is a perfect time to start getting that help, but I have to acknowledge it. Not necessarily, uh, again, if I'm hearing you correctly, and I think the phrasing of this is, in my opinion, could be different, is one of the things that require, that's required from you personally is to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And vulnerability is really hard. And again, it's not specific to one gender, yeah. but yeah. certainly yeah. when there's a cultural component to it and... In our experiences as, you know, uh, growing up in a Mexican household, it's, you know, you're not allowed to talk about your emotions. You're not allowed to express your emotions. If you do, it's seen as bad. Yeah. And so, um, again, part of the other problem is that there are these binary words that limit us to being able to see ourselves beyond good and bad, yeah. for lack of words. And so, but back to vulnerability, um, that's really hard, you know, to put yourself out there and to be potentially judged ridiculed, right, mm -hmm. by grown men, uh, women, our partners, um, the people that we surround ourselves. Um, but I'll tell you what, um, it's been my experience most recently, putting myself out there and has led to being the recipient of a lot of compassion from, other pe from the people around me mm -hmm. that I was not expecting, right. that has like touched me very deeply. Yeah. You know, and so um, I, I don't mind sharing that because, um, again, m in my personal life recently, have faced some adversity and talking to other people about it, you know, again, has has allowed me to be the recipient of some of that compassion from other people that um, I should have known, like, I should have yeah. known that that was going to, you know, that those people would be there for me, including yourself, which I appreciate. Thank you. Um and and some sometimes people don't see that you know that 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 that's the benefit from being able to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I'm mindful of um, is also being in the position that I am to be able to talk about that in a way where yeah. you're modeling for other people right mm -hmm. that it's okay that you're human and that you're going to be, you know in life you're going to face some adversities and that talking about it is normal for lack of words right. you know and that. It's through that that you are the recipient of compassion by others. Normal, normalizing our social and emotional development is something that I think we're headed in the right direction. Well, what do you want children to be able to do is to be compassionate towards yeah. others and yeah. to be empathetic. And so, again, you are modeling that with young children and you're modeling that with um, adults. And so what they do, of course, is, again, what Rachel says is that they will mirror yeah. right, what they see. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So what's that one big takeaway you want for our audience to, to get from you? This is just my lived experience, and I hope that it inspires you all to pursue your passion. Mm -hmm. um, there's every, as you said earlier, that everybody has a subjective experience, and there's a value to everybody's experiences in life if you see it as that. A very deep conversation, Mr. Victor Soto. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you. Thank you. And we'll see you guys again. Capture the passion.